Believing is never static in the Christian life. Habakkuk counseled himself with the words, the just ones live by faith. And he was not talking about uh, a singular act of salvation or justification in his life. He was talking about his need to confront whatever God threw at him with faith in God's promise and God's covenant. As you read through Cockrell, this, uh, as he deals with this section, you're going to be exposed to a wonderful explanation of the appeals the writer of Hebrews is making to these Christians. Uh, Cockrell understands the appeal as a passionate call to true believers, urging them to persevere by faith. What Cockrell gets wrong is the consequence of not persevering. For him, failure is the loss of salvation. You may be surprised to know that exegetically deciding who is right, whether you can or you cannot lose your salvation, all hinges on the meaning of two metaphors in this, in this section of Hebrews. I say exegetically because generally uh, deciding between these two positions is done theologically, not through a careful analysis of the text itself. In this section, the way we understand the house and the rest metaphors will determine whether we think people can or cannot lose their salvation. And yes, house and rest are metaphors. The writer's not talking about a place where you can live or taking a nap. He's using these uh, terms to refer to something else. And it's our job to figure out what he means. Now, as we come to chapter 3 and uh, verse 1, I want to look at that with you because the writer starts out, once again, using language that's reminiscent of language that he's used in chapter 1. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in the heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. He refers to them as holy brothers. He describes them in two ways. They're holy brothers, a pretty strong statement that he has confidence that they are genuine believers. And then he says they are participants uh, on the heavenly calling or participants of the heavenly calling. Now, the word companions has already appeared in chapter 1 and verse 9. There it said that Jesus <clears throat> was set above his companions by the Father. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. And the, the picture is that Jesus is on a, a journey with people. Uh, and this fits very well with the whole theme of the book of Hebrews, that, that we are on the same journey Jesus took and that he is with us. He is present with us. He will never leave us or forsake us, as is said later in the book, and that he is there as our great high priest to help us. So, when we think about the meaning of this word companions, it is probably a reference to the fact that we are journeying with Jesus. Now, the term is used in a number of places uh, in the book of Hebrews. I've already mentioned chapter 1 and verse 9. It's also in, used again in verse uh, 14 of chapter 3, where it says, for we have come to share with Christ, or literally, we have been companions with Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. Uh, the attempt is often made to read the Pauline doctrine of being in Christ uh, into this passage, but the concept of being united to the cosmic Christ, uh, being united in the body of Christ, is not a part of the author of Hebrews' argument. That is definitely uh, something that is read out of Pauline theology into the book of Hebrews. I think it is much better to understand, especially given the conditional nature of verse 14, what he's saying is, we have proven to be those who are walking on this journey with Jesus if we do what he did, if we follow in obedience and faith to the Father. But here in chapter 3 and verse 1, the command is, we are to fix our eyes on Jesus. Consider Jesus, very strong term, and it is, is also used at various places in the letter. Fix your eyes on Jesus. It means to contemplate or to consider uh, intently. He tells us what it is about Jesus that we're supposed to consider. He doesn't say consider his eternality. He doesn't necessarily say consider all of the things we've just talked about in chapters 1 and 2, though 
One of them is related to where he finishes chapter 2. He tells us exactly what we're supposed to think about with reference to Jesus. He uses two terms, the apostle and high priest of our confession. Now, those are important terms because uh, actually the word apostle is nowhere else used in the New Testament as a title for Jesus. The writer of the Gospel of John uses the verbal form of this word to describe the Father sending Jesus, but uh, nowhere is the word apostle used as a title of Jesus except here. And I think it's significant for what the writer is saying. Apostle and high priest talk about the mission that Jesus has. Uh, in chapter 2, he's already told us in verse uh, 17 that he is a faithful high priest in service to God. Uh, that was a part of his mission, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. That was his mission. And so the writer now is telling us, all right, think about Jesus in terms of his mission. That was significant for the, for the Hebrews because they were on a mission too. They were companions with Jesus in this mission. And the likelihood, as we're going to see as we move through the, the, this section, the likelihood is that they are going to break faith with God and fail in their mission. So right off the bat, think about Jesus in terms of his mission. All right, one more word in verse 1 that I want us to think about, and that is the word confess. The writer says that uh, we are to consider, or the Hebrews were to consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of their confession. Now, a confession is simply a statement that you believe something is true. The term will be used a couple more times in Hebrews, and when we get to chapter 4, I will unpack it in a little bit greater detail. But for now, I want you to think about the fact that when the writer says Jesus is the object of our confession, he's saying this is what you have said you believe to be true, and therefore it should shape your view of reality and the way you live your life. That's all that he's really saying in this term. But then he goes on and he begins to talk about the faithfulness of Christ and Moses within the household of God. He says... Uh, Moses or Christ was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses is also faithful in all of God's house. Again, notice the issue of mission, Jesus' mission. He, Jesus was faithful to him who appointed him, who gave him a mission. And then he says, Moses was also faithful uh, in the same way. And then he points out that there's a difference between the two because Jesus is the creator of the house and Moses is a steward within the house. We must be careful about making that adversarial any way because it's not. The whole issue is they were both faithful and therefore they both become the basis for this paradigm of belief. But I do think that it's important for us to parse out a bit this house metaphor. What does he mean when he says that they were faithful in the house? And it becomes even more important by the time we get down to verse 6 where it says this. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house if indeed we hold our confidence, we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. So the conditional clause there, we are his house if, clearly implies we are not his house if we don't. If we don't hold our confidence in our boasting, we are not his house. And if we do hold our confidence in our boasting, we are his house. So as you can see, depending on how you interpret the word house, how you, what metaphorical significance you give to the word house will determine a lot about your views of salvation, uh, whether it can be lost or, or what's involved here. So let's think a little bit about this idea of the house. There are various views, as you can imagine. Westcott says that it refers to the organized society in which God dwells. Pretty broad. Cockrell the author of the assigned commentary says that is the one people of God. Uh, Kyle of the Kyle and Dillich commentaries says that it's uh, that it represents Israel as a whole. And then the TN, TDNT, the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, argues against understanding it as the wider purposes of God. 
Hughes says that the word house refers to the realm of Moses' stewardship. And I think that that is actually a, a pretty good statement. But as with all metaphors, uh, it's important for us to, to look into the Bible and see how they're used. Now, granted, the word house may be used differently in different places, but I do think that there is a flow of thought with regard to this metaphor that goes all the way back to the, G the book of Genesis and carries on throughout the New Testament, actually building momentum as it goes until you get to some of the later New Testament books like the pastoral epistles, where the concept of household stewardship is integral to the argument of those three letters. So let's think about this for a moment. When we think about creation, think about what's happening there. God creates the universe and his creative, the, the way that creation is portrayed in Genesis is an ordering by God. God brings order out of the chaos and then he entrusts that ordered creation to the stewardship of man. He gives humanity, the man and the woman, dominion over the earth. And what was their job? Well, the uh, job that they had was to rule and to develop this planet along the lines of divine ordering, the lines that God had established in his creative work. Uh, you travel on through the book of Genesis, and it isn't very long in Genesis 6 where it says of humanity, um, God says this in Genesis 6.13, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. So think about that. God created the planet. He ordered it, brought order out of the chaos. He entrusts it to the stewardship of humanity. And what does humanity do? They fill the earth, not with God's glory, but they fill the earth with violence. And, and so we see here a, a breaking with this whole concept of what the stewardship of, of human beings was supposed to be. We come to uh, the times of Abraham, and in the days of Abraham, uh, there are references to the household of Abraham. Uh, when Abraham talked with God in Genesis chapter 15, he was concerned that a servant within his household would inherit his whole house. Now, of course, that was more than just the people of his house. That was everything that pertained to Abraham, and not only that, all of the influence that Abraham had. He would pick up the Abrahamic brand, as it were, and he would, he would own all of that. We come to, to Numbers, and again, as I said, the, the basic idea here that, that Hughes points out is that it, it's uh, the sphere of Moses' stewardship. Moses was faithful in all my house. Now remember, Moses was the fountainhead of divine revelation. Uh, there's a great emphasis in the book of uh, Numbers and Exodus on the ordering of God. Even Hebrews picks up on this, and it says that everything was built exactly to the pattern that God had given. Moses was faithful to God's house because he ordered everything the way God revealed it should be ordered. We move on in the Old Testament and we come to uh, the house of David and the house of Saul. When you look at 2 Samuel 3, 1 to 6 and 2 Samuel 7 and 11, where it speaks about the house of David and the house of Abraham or Saul, it's very clear that it's not talking about an institution, an organization, a location, or a physical structure of any sort. Rather, what's involved here is the influence associated with the name of David and Saul. Now, obviously, that involved all those other things. But, but ultimately, uh, it involved the, the growth of the influence of David and the growth of the influence of Saul. So in chapter 2, or chapter 2 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 to 6, when it talks about David's house growing, and Saul's house diminishing, it's not simply talking about the number of physical descendants in the house of David or the number of physical descendants in the house of Saul. Rather, it's talking about the level of influence attached to David and his itinerary or, and, and his agenda. David and everything that he stood for, that was growing in influence. Okay, let's draw a few conclusions about the significance of this uh, house metaphor. First of all, the house of God is not the family of God, uh, nor is it 
the tabernacle. Those things may be ex uh, part of giving expression to the house of God, but they do not totally define uh, the meaning of the metaphor. The house is the structure through which God desires to accomplish his will in an age. Just as the will of David or of Saul or of Abraham were accomplished through his house, they were the platform for the realization of the agenda of that householder. They were governed by the ordering of that householder. So um, the house is whatever structure that exists for the realization of God's will, God's ordering in the world. The house is based upon and develops out of the word of God. So revelation is critical to the house metaphor. In a sense, the house is defined by the revelation because that revelation sets out the ordering that uh, God wants his stewards to enact in the world. And, and so in one sense, the house is something we are, something that we are becoming. It is reality and its potentiality. Uh, the degree to which we are effectively uh, representing the ordering of God in the world is the degree to which we are his house. A church is the house of God to the degree that it is a, an expression of God's ordering of reality in the world. A family, a Christian family, is the house to the degree that that family, in the way they live and act, represents the ordering of God in the world. And that's why as this metaphor develops through the Bible, when it comes to the New Testament, uh, as I said, in the pastoral epistles, the mission of the church is to be the house of God. We are stewards of God's household, which means our mission is to bring the ordering of God, to represent, to, to give a visualization to the world, to the society at large, of the ordering of God. So when we come to Hebrews, and the writer of Hebrews says that we are his house if we continue with our confidence and our boldness, uh, it makes total sense. Uh, our ability to act out our confession, to live out our faith, is the key to us being the house of God, those people who are bringing the ordering of God to the world. And we're going to see as we move on through uh, chapter 3 that, that God selected Israel. Uh, he wanted to utilize them to bring his ordering to the world, but they failed because they didn't believe. And yet, God didn't desert them. They, they didn't enter rest, correct, but for 40 years, God protected them, preserved them, fed them with manna, took care of them as his people. They were his people, even though they're the worst representatives of the house of God as they wandered in the wilderness under the judgment of God, continuing to rebel against God, refusing that generation, that wilderness generation to circumcise their children because they did not believe the promise. So they were the worst possible expression of the household of God, but they were the people of God.